Hello, I'm Dan Lynch, and you can join me and Simon Phipps as we talk to Francis Irving, the CEO of ScraperWiki, up next on Floss Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly, episode 185, recorded Wednesday, the 5th of October, 2011. Scraper Wiki. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies direct on your PC, Mac, iPad, phone, or TV. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to another episode of Floss Weekly, the, fl the show about free Libre open source software. You may be able to tell by now that I'm not Randall Schwartz. I'm also not Aaron Newcomb. Uh, my name's uh, Dan Lynch and I'm here guest hosting this week while Randall's away on uh, another cruise. And uh, I'm pleased to say that I'm joined, uh, well, by another Brit, in fact. It's a British takeover this week uh, with Simon Phipps. Simon, how are you doing? Uh, very well, thank you. I was actually on the show last week. Maybe this is a British takeover, I don't know. Mm, well, it, it could well be, yeah. I mean, we've, we've even got a British guest today in the, in the form of uh, a friend of mine, actually, from Liverpool, uh, Francis Irving, who is the CEO of ScraperWiki. And uh, ScraperWiki is a, a kind of central resource for people to build um, tools, uh, scrapers, <laughs> as, you, as you might guess, to build scrapers to, um, to get data from government websites and any other kind of website, really, and build it into a structured form that uh, can be reused and so on. So that's going uh, to be interesting to talk about. So, um, any any thoughts on that before we uh, before we get into it, Simon? Well, I, I took a look at the Scrape Wiki site uh, when you send out the details of the um, of the program, and I found it very interesting. I also particularly noticed that Francis has been involved in lots of uh, activist uh, programming for things like the My Society site, for They Work for You, for Fix My Street, and a whole load of other initiatives that will be familiar to uh, British hackers and geeks but maybe won't be so familiar to the rest of the audience. So it will be interesting to dig into those for people. Mm, excellent, yeah. It sounds very good. And before we do that, I just need to take a quick moment to tell you uh, about our sponsor, this, this uh, show. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Netflix. Uh, Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies direct to you instantly, uh, which means you can save time, money, and hassle. Uh, there are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. Um, you can use your Mac, PC. Uh, I believe you can even use Linux now. They're talking about a Linux client, which sounds good to me. Uh, and you can use the iPad. And, and other kind of tablets. You can get it on your phone, uh, iPhone, or some Android phones as well. If you have a gaming console, such as the Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii, you can watch it on your TV right through that. Or you can use a Roku box, which I know um, Aaron Randall actually does, and uh, he's been very happy with it. So uh, with Netflix, you can watch, movie, watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices, and you can begin watching a movie on one device and then continue finishing off watching it on another device, which sounds really good if you're a person like me who kind of starts a film and then the phone rings and then you you know you have to move and do it somewhere else uh, that sounds very useful and whichever way you choose to access Netflix you can watch as many movies or TV shows as you want as part of your monthly subscription and you can cancel at any time and uh, we have a, a special offer at the moment to uh, try Netflix right now for 30 days free if you go to netflix.com slash twit you can uh, you can do that there and uh, be sure to use that URL netflix.com slash twit and uh, we thank Netflix for their support of twit Right then, so should we go ahead and bring on our guest, uh, Francis Irving, who is the CEO of ScraperWiki. Francis, welcome to the show. Hello there, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. And uh, Randall usually starts these shows by, or starts the interviews by asking people where they're calling from. But in our case, it's probably not worth me doing that because you're actually calling from Liverpool and only a few hundred yards away from where I am right now. <laughs> so um, that's yeah, going to be interesting. So. I, I, I suppose, really, how's, the, how's the weather 500 yards over there? Is it any better? It's actually quite nice. <laughs> it's not raining today. Um, and it's really nice. The video conferencing is so good now that you prefer to talk to me like this rather than, rather than <laughs> personally. Yeah. Also, no, so. It's because I haven't got two cameras, really. And uh, it would have been difficult <laughs> for us to squeeze onto one 
onto one camera. Yeah. Um, so I, I gave a brief kind of overview uh, intro to Scraper Wiki at the start of the show, but can you um, start off by giving us a kind of a, an outline of what Scraper Wiki is and, uh, and what it does? Yeah, so Scraper Wiki is a place where you can write scripts to do things like scrape data and analyze it. And you can share these with other people and reuse them uh, across the internet. So think of kind of something like YouTube or Google Docs only for doing wrangling of data. Hmm. And cool. Maybe, and, maybe, uh, sorry, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, the best way to sort of explain it is probably give an example from its history, which is it, it came from this, um, as you know, I've worked for my society. I've been involved a lot in these public data projects which involve making bits of government more usable for people. And quite yeah. early on, we did a lot of screen scraping for that. So, for example, Julian, who's the, the CTO of Scraper Wiki now, scraped the Parliament website in order to build uh, a site that's called theyworkforyou.com that tells you about things like how your MP voted and lets you find out about them. And we found that maintaining these scrapers is quite hard and also sourcing enough of them is quite hard over time. It's easy to knock one off to start with, but then people tend to mm. lose them and not maintain them. So part of the, the history of it is to, is to make that uh, a better process. Mm, excellent. And um, how long has the, the project been running for now then? It's been up for about a year and a half now. And we've got lots of interesting examples. If you can have a look at scraperwiki.com and you can see there's some featured ones on the front page. You can see the kinds of things that people are doing with it. Um, like mm. turning basically the unstructured web into, a, into structured data that you can then do more interesting things with. Okay, so um, the, the kind of um, core of the problem, I suppose I'll call it, is that um, uh, a lot of, uh, well, in this country, in the UK, a lot of people will be listening in other countries, we have a thing called Freedom of Information, the Freedom of Information Act, which means that the government have to legally oblige to release certain pieces of information. And um, uh, depending on your perspective, some people would say they make this hard deliberately, uh, make it hard to analyze this data deliberately because <laughs> they don't really want, don't really want to release it. Um, I suppose that's a matter of opinion. But um, so a lot of the data will be kind of published in one big block of text which is no use and so on. So this is what Scraper Wiki um, helps with, isn't it? It helps you structure that data and so on? Yeah, so at its simplest, it's just to turn it into a spreadsheet so you can, it's someone non-technical can do something with it in Excel. And if it's more complicated, it makes an API so you can make applications and do things like that. Um, mm. So the raw technology behind Scraper Wiki is exactly all the open source tools that people use to do this kind of thing. So all we're doing is, is making a product, making it more visible and easy to use. Things that people do anyway, like use... Um, libraries like Nokogiri and Ruby or things like LXML in Python. We make those accessible from, from a browser and scheduled to run uh, in, like, in the cloud. So you mm. can use you, these tools then become more accessible and more kind of visible. Um, people tend to do them on their own. They'll have their own shell account somewhere and write a script and put it in a cron job. And they're not going to store the door data in various different ways. Whereas if you do all that on Scraper Wiki, then becomes in a, a standard format that other people easily see. You get a page for your scraper. You can get other people to help you maintain your scraper. Because it is mm. indeed by default a wiki, just like the name says. So. Okay, yeah, because I was curious how the scraper and the wiki kind of fit, <laughs> fit together. Um, yeah. So, it, yeah, it's a collection in a wiki of different scrapers that people can collaborate on. And so yeah, on. yeah. And it is, as you say, about making use of, of government data, but also increasingly corporate data, which is opened up, but is, is hard to do anything with. And it's actually mm. a bit more than that. It's philosophically, when you get some data from someone, you have to to some extent, you have to work at it with code in order to put it in a form that you need because by almost by definition, what you want to do it with, it with it is different from the person who made it and why they reproduced it in that way. And if you're not doing something different, then you're probably not doing something new. So from the point of view of a journalist, we get lots of uh, very popular with uh, journalists. You mm. want to find things in the data that the person who made the data didn't want you to find. And... <laughs> um, and to do that, you have to work with it on your own terms. So kind of one of our, our philosophies is, is scraping isn't just a horrible thing we have to do at the moment for the next 10 years. It's actually just the first part of working with data and doing proper analysis on data that's analytical um, and linking data in a way that you want to link it and refining it in a way that you want to refine it. Hmm. Okay, then. So, I mean, we, we have a, quite a technical audience, so I probably don't need to explain mm. this to most of them, but I think we should probably explain quickly what a, what a scraper actually is. Um, so, you're doing screen scraping in this case, in most cases, which is kind of taking um, a, a block of text yeah. or whatever and yeah. breaking it up into smaller bits. Can you explain that a little bit for everyone? 
so, so the very, very basic is, is reading a web page. So literally doing an HTTP request, just like a web browser would do, downloading a web page, and then writing some heuristics, really, like a, a set of rules that roughly work for that specific page and pull out data mm -hmm. from it. So the, it's very, very common nowadays. Now HTML is more used and better used. You can do it with um, CSS selectors. So these are the same things that people use to, to set up the design of a web page in a style sheet. You can use the same selectors to pull data out. And that's kind of coding, because there's this li linguistic element of saying what selects you use and what the nesting rules are. But then you also will have to do more processing with the data. So you might want to pass a date and convert it from being a human-readable date into a machine-readable date that you can actually then query with. And you might want to link up to another data set and, and connect, uh, create an identifier from something that in the original data doesn't have an identifier. Mm. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really using code to encode some heuristics that change the, the format of data. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, do the do the uh, the scrapers break often? Because I imagine you know people move things around on web pages, yeah. they redesign their stuff. Is that a problem for you guys? They, they do, and one of the good things about Scrapebook is you can keep track of that because you get a dashboard that shows you which of your scrapers are broken, and you can it can email the, the people who are contributing to it to tell them when it's broken. So there's a kind mm. of rather than what tends to happen is you tend to just get you set it up on a cron job and you get lots of cron spam. You don't really want to deal with more email cron spam, and, and Scrapebook breaks that apart by making it so that when it goes wrong, that's the kind of public information that's gone wrong. So maybe someone else will come along and fix it for you rather than you having to do it. No, no that's very cool. We've actually, uh, we, we've got some questions from the IRC channel, uh, people who are watching oh. and listening right now. So um, Hello, uh, we've got a question... <laughs> We've got a question from Sands of Mars, who um, says they're interested in the potential for the use of this inside corporations. And I think that's mm. something that you kind of all referenced a little bit there. Uh, they're, saying, they're saying as a business application, is that something that you're looking into? Absolutely. So we've, in fact, just launched uh, in, in the beta version at the moment a vault feature, which lets people write scrapers that live inside a private vault, so they, mm -hmm. the, the code is no longer visible. So it's... Um, uh, it's no longer, the scrapers themselves are no longer open source, even though the platform still is. And the um, people can pay for hosting to have these, these private scrapers hosted. So that's for cases where you want to, so sometimes it might be you want to write some quite expensive scrapers that might take a lot of time and then do something else with the data that you don't want to share. But sometimes it might be that you, you're, you can't share it because you have to use a password or a login in order to get the data that you're scraping. So that's kind of mm. our first step towards, uh, towards corporate use. What I'd like to see later on, maybe uh, in our roadmap, maybe in a, in a year's time, year and a half, would be to have a firewall install of, of Scraper Wiki. So you could use it to, it's like you might buy a Google search appliance to search your intranet. You might buy a Scraper Wiki install to get people to keep their data wrangling in one place within a corporation and organize it. So this is, mm. this is the, the kind of category of software that Scraper Wiki is. It's called the Data Hub, and it's a new category, much like no one had heard of web content management systems in the sort of early 1990s. But by 2000, mm. that was the really exciting area, was what content management systems going to win, which ones are important. And we think that there's a lot of opportunity for collaborating on data and on processing of data, refining of data, visualization of data on the web. And it's not, it's not been done very well yet. There are lots of people trying to do it and having, so, and having some success. But it's, it's mm. as, as the data explodes more and more, there's this, um, from the open source point of view, it's this move from talking about open source code to also talking about open data and how, and, and how they two relate. So we have a, we have a quick follow up from um, from Sands of Mars who was in the in the uh, chat room there who wants to know if there's a REST interface for the wiki. Um, I'm not sure how that quite relates to the other question, but that was the oh. other thing they wanted to know about. Um, so there is a there's a web API for getting your data out. So when you've written a scraper, you get if you do. Um, uh, on each scraper page, there's a button to get to the API for that scraper. And that actually has an SQL-based API, web API. So you can literally put SQL queries in the URL to get your data out. So if you want to limit it or sort it or select it in a certain way, that's really easy to do. There is a, also an API for getting data out of the site, so information about scrapers. Um, what we don't specifically have yet is a documented API for editing the code, if that's what he means. But it, it's mm. something I would, I would love to, to happen. So that would be, often people want to do things like maybe integrate it with an editor, so maybe edit from Emacs directly into Scraper Wiki, and we don't have a documented API for that, although, of course, you, it's all just post requests, the, the mm -hmm. JavaScript. So the code at the moment you write in CodeMirror in, in, in an editor and in your browser, 
And that is done in such a way that when you save it, it obviously submits the save code with a post request. So you could, in theory, call, yeah, call that as if it was an API if you wanted to. So uh, Simon's got some stuff he wants to ask. So I'll, uh, Simon, do you want to bring us back in and uh, carry on? Hello, Simon. Oh, can you hear us? We can, he yes. can hear us. We, we don't hear you, Simon. Ah. I think your mic's muted, Simon. Hello, Simon. I can see him talking, but I can't hear him. <laughs> oh, no, that was me. My, oh, no. I'm oh, sorry. It was, it was Petaluma. <laughs> it was Petaluma. Uh, you're good now. Ah, there we go. Excellent. We go. So let, let's pretend we're coming in here, shall we? <laughs> so, Francis, uh, I'm fascinated to see that uh, you've been involved in My Society, which is one of my, mm. fa my favourite uh, organisations. I've got a, a, a very soft spot for the Open Rights Group in the UK, which is a uh, the the it's kind of Europe's equivalent of the Electronic Frontier Foundation for our uh, American uh, viewers and listeners, uh, and you've been involved in My Society. Now that will that's only right. be familiar to geeks in the UK. Would you like to explain a little bit about what that is? Because I think that's so, one of so, your big motivations behind Scraper Wiki as well. What what geeks in the US might be familiar with is the Sunlight Foundation, which was is a big a US that watches the House of Representatives and the, the Congress, and they were inspired by My Society. So that was the, a, a site called They Work for You that My Society made, which was the first like, group of activists in the world to scrape a um, parliament and then make it more usable for citizens. So there's a there's a kind of link between, so what I did at my society was just trying to make government more usable and having little hacks on top of government to use kind of the openness of the web to try and make government more open and to make it easier to use. And Scraper Wiki is about, partly about commoditizing that and making it easier for people to do that kind of, of, of hack on top of data that governments have. Okay, so the, the code that you used in Scraper Wiki, was that the code that you created for uh, theyworkforyou.com? It's not the actual same code, but the kind of things we learnt from doing it are very much embedded in Scraper Wiki. So things we discovered were interesting about about how you, how data is gathered and reused. Um, yeah. So I, I'm a big fan of uh, They Work For You. Again, for our uh, American uh, viewers and listeners and for folks elsewhere in the world, They Work For You is a website that lets you subscribe to your, uh, your member of parliament, for your congress critter and uh, get an RSS feed or email alerts whenever they say something. And that's all done by scraping as well, is it, Francis? It is all done by scraping, and it, it, as well as getting things like that, it gets structured data, such as the voting record, so we know exactly how they voted and can create very nice uh, one-sentence visualisation saying this MP voted for or against invading Iraq. Um, and those are kind of, you can think of them as sort of semi-automated journalism, where if you don't have enough money to pay investigative journalists to special custom write you a story, you can make a, a website that goes and uses open data and scraping to create those stories for you. And, and that's now gone a lot further into crowdsourcing some of the work. For example, you, you've got the visitors to the site annotating the videos that are put up by the, uh, yeah. the BBC Parliament channel. Yeah, there's a bunch of interesting crowdsource stuff in, in the My City website. So the, um, we had a trouble that we wanted to show video on the site because obviously people like watching their MPs speaking uh, and it can be more fun than reading them. So we needed to link up the video feed with the text which we get from the transcript of, of, of Hansard, it's called, which is the parliamentary transcript. And to do that, we have a game you play where you can wa basically watch, and we have a whole load of people who love doing it, so they're very competitive about it. They watch parliamentary video, and when it gets to a certain point where a certain piece of text is, is just about to be said, they hit a big button to say, this, is, this piece of text matches against this piece of video. And that means that we can then have um, let you play the video and, and it go through it all in order. And there are a whole, one of the interesting things about the crowd, the, the crowd here is, is where you get someone to do something selflessly, so it's actually selfishly, that adds to a, a selfless whole. So another example of that, there's a site called Fix My Street, which uh, my society created, which is for reporting things like potholes and abandoned cars. And the, the similar version of it, there's a, a thing, an open 311 movement in America, and a thing called C-Click Fix, which has come from the kind of Fix My Street idea. And... The good thing about Fix My Street is once you've reported a problem, rather than it being buried in some IT secret hidden IT system inside a, a bit of government, it becomes a piece of open data that then anyone can see the problems being reported, they can see patterns in the problem reporting, they can see like a bug tracker, it's like a kind of open bug tracker. So I think, yeah, a lot of the ideas in this area are things which um, 
with hindsight, the open source movement's like very world leading on, but no one really realized at the time that those were the things that could be used in so many other areas. So, so literally having an open bug tracker is like really radical and started out with the open source movement. And likewise, other bits, any, any other ticketing system in the world can be opened up in the same way. And gradually they will be. And it's, 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 it's quite exciting how much there is still to play out on the internet as we move sort of to the next phase. Right, so you've, you've mentioned um, uh, they work for you and you've mentioned Fix My Street. Do you want us to tell us about uh, what do they know, the, uh, the Freedom of Information Aggregator? Mm. Yeah, so what do they know is another, another of these hacks on top of government where the idea is you can make, anyone can make a Freedom of Information request in, in, in most countries in the world, now, in most sort of developed countries in the world now, and get a, send a letter saying, I want this particular document, I want to... Uh, want this contract between this agency and another one and then the agency has to send it to you with certain exceptions and the clever trick we realize is actually you don't want it to just be hidden in your email box when you get the document back you want to be able to share it with other people you don't mind other people being able to get access to it and there's no point requesting it multiple times so we built a kind of which what turned out to be basically a public email plan where you can send an email in public to the authority and then they just reply normally as if they're replying to an, just to an email from you, which is in fact what they are doing. But we intercept it via a, a magic email address and then republish it, which is um, so similarly to the way Fix My Street makes problem reports open, this makes like, government documents open. And what's good about it is the data it releases is the data that people, someone actually wanted. So there's an activist, a journalist, someone in a business who wanted this data. So it tends to be naturally slightly more interesting than if you just get the data that gets released by proactively by civil servants. And quite often, in fact, we scrape it as well. So people will then take uh, like complicated Excel files or, or bits of data in text that's come out via what do they know and then feed it into Scraper Wiki so they can do some more things with it after that. Right. And is there any similar system for handling um, freedom of information replies that come back as paper? Because a, 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 a friend of mine over in um, mm. the Netherlands runs a Big Wobber uh, over there, which is the uh, equivalent of a, the Freedom of Information mm. Act. And he tends to get all of his replies as mm. huge stacks of photocopied documents. So first of all, I would, uh, yeah, I would recommend doing the, lead, the forceful thing of trying to make them not do that. So in the UK, we were really worried about this when we launched What Do They Know? And we had plans to have like a scanning centre at a university where we would scan in incoming documents. But it turned out that if we don't give a postal address, so we don't even tell the authority a postal address, we just give them an email. So often they'll just reply to email. And then if they say, no, I want a postal address, you go, well, why do you want one? Haven't you got a scanner? Can't you scan it in and send it to me? And uh, we even have Julian here once embarrassed uh, a local authority by going, oh, so you haven't got a scanner? Well, I'll post you a scanner. And he offered to send them, you know, pay 30 quid and send them a scanner. <laughs> if they scan it in. And he was so embarrassed that they scanned it in anyway. <laughs> they didn't have what they were doing. So first of all, yeah, put pressure on, put, like, just embarrass them with the media. So the media love that kind of story. Like, authority can't, you know, so paper, not, not paperless, they can't even send a, a, an electronic response to a request. If that all fails, you can do what the guys at Muckrock are doing. So Muckrock is a US site that's very similar to What Do They Know, which um, makes, lets you make FOR requests. And they, they let, you often have to pay to do it through them because the US agencies are more, are more often charge a fee. But they will also, as part of the fee you pay to make the request, they scan it in for you. And they have a center with a postal address with a, like literally the employee people who scan in the documents and put them on the web for you. Um, so if, that, if you're really stuck, the Dutch people could go that way. Um, and I should at this point explain from an open source point of view what do they know is really interesting right now. There's a project called Alavitelli, which is spelled A-L-A-V-E-T-E-L-I. It's actually the town in Sweden where freedom of information was invented back in the 18th century. Um, and Alavitelli is a, the source code behind what do they know, but made more general so it can be used for other sites. Um, and there's a whole bunch of sites now coming out by different countries. Uh, the first one of those is for the European Union. It's called asktheeu.org. But you can now, now it's, it's becoming a, a more of its own kind of proper open source project where it's getting contributions from different, different installs in different countries. So um, uh, if, you've, if you want to use that code, then it's now much easier to use than it's ever been. There's a, a great person called Seb Bacon who's doing lots of the coding at my society to make that happen. Um, so I would ha have a look for Alavis Halley and join their mailing list if, if someone wants to right. bring, bring this idea to their own place. 
So how much of the work that you've done on these, um, these activism, it, it's, it's kind of practical hacking activism, activism. How much of this work has been able to extend beyond the UK to produce change? Oh, it gets copied loads, um, which is one of the rewarding things. So people, like, like I said earlier, the Sunlight Foundation were very inspired by what we, they saw we were doing in Parliament. So before that, there was a problem in the US of these kinds of activists being very partisan, so they would try and use these kinds of hacks to partisan advantage. And that doesn't work as well, because actually people expect sort of the same integrity as, as, a, as a really good journalist. They expect non-partisanship and like factualness of these kinds of resources. Um, so, yeah, so just in terms of conceptually, it's been copied and has led lots of the kind of examples that have come from, from my society have led to this whole open government movement and the open data movement that, that ScraperWick is part of trying, of making um, uh, more solid and more kind of useful. Uh, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is in terms of code, we've, we've had less success. There's a really interesting problem, actually, which... Um, which I should talk about because it's, it's, I think, one of the big problems with open source right now, which is that we haven't really moved on from enough from this question of how do we clone a desktop that's as good as Microsoft's desktop to the question of how do we deal with web services. So um, the My Society sites and ScraperWiki indeed are licensed with the Ethereum GPL because there's this thing, there'd be no point using the GPL because then with a web with a web service, if it was GPL, someone could just host it, it host it with a with a fork and not have to give away the code anyway. So you may as well license it with a BSD license. So there's this interesting transition to the web happening, um, and one of the problems is getting contributions to web services, like getting code contributions to them, and for mm -hmm. ones which people install themselves, like WordPress, that happens relatively naturally because there are enough people who have their own WordPress install that they submit patches back. Um, and to sites that are really high profile and develop their community well in the right way, that, that, that works quite well. So an example of that would be, say, media wiki software behind Wikipedia. But when you make a new site, you make a site like They Work For You, it's actually the inertia, the difficulty of getting someone to download it and develop it is quite high. They have to, even if you give them a machine image, it's like what format should the machine image be? And if they don't have a machine image, they have to set up a database, they have to install the right libraries, they've got to set up the search, they've got to download gigabytes of data and load it into the site. And that's before they can even make any code changes. And I think there's a, a psychological problem that when you make a code change to a website like that, it doesn't immediately change the website. Whereas if you make a code change to a desktop, application, you can then start running the new shiny desktop application with the bug fix or the new feature you wanted. So I think there's a, this is a really interesting challenge and I'd like to see the open source community thinking more about it and I know lots of people are thinking about it. Um, there are some very exciting projects like this one called Unhosted, which is thinking about how to gain all the advantages of the web in terms of usability and access to data from everywhere, but separate uh, the privacy from the data and, and in a very right. interesting way. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it's Quite a good field. And Ala Vitelli is the best example so far of my society getting people to contribute to code, but we're also having some similar success with the fixed my street code as well. Um, well I, mean, hmm. I mean, the stuff that you're doing with ScraperWiki is, is very interesting from that regard, in that there is mm. a direct hands on consequence of going and working on the code mm. that is very motivating and very, very mm. immediate. You can immediately see it. You know, one of the reasons we built uh, ScrapeWiki is uh, I, I, we realized, uh, this is Julian, who's uh, one of the founders and CTO of ScrapeWiki, he and I realized many years ago that writing code in a web browser makes a lot of sense. It breaks lots of these problems. So I, I discovered that there's this barrier to contribution that my society had of people having to literally download and set up the development environment for a web application. And if you don't have to download and set anything up, if the environment is already configured on the server, but you can just fork it. So imagine you could just go to, I don't know, a site like Flickr and fork Flickr, the whole of Flickr and your data and then hack away on it and then do a pull request back to them. That would be quite, that would make more people contribute. And you can imagine an open source version of Flickr or an open source version of Gmail where that was the main way people contributed. Um, and mm. no, nobody's done that yet and I think it will happen. And there are things like Cloud9 IDE, which uh, is a very exciting open source collaborative ID, uh, yeah, internet coding IDE. Um, and of course, you can see it in proprietary things like GitHub as well. Where, where they're, they're competing very well with, with, with open source by taking advantage of many of the kind of community aspects with, without, without the full sharing of, of, of the code. So I think um, 
uh, yeah, I think it's, it's quite exciting, actually. I'm, I'm hoping there'll be more projects that, that do stuff on the web, but in a way that kind of has the, the ethics of, of the free software movement in it. Hmm. That's interesting. I know um, Mozilla were working on, on something similar quite recently, mm. um, like a, a browser where you could switch from viewing the page into editing the page, it, mm. you know, just by pressing a button. Um, that would be very cool, yeah. and I'd like to think, you know, they'd be good at that. Yeah, I keep every time I see someone from uh, Mozilla, I try and pimp uh, unhosted to them because I think it's a very important technology for what their goals they're trying to achieve of kind of privacy on the web. Uh, they actually wrote a Mozilla Skywriter, which has somehow merged and become what's called the Ace Cloud Editor, which is the uh, Ajax Ajax .org Cloud Editor, which is the uh, one of the JavaScript syntax highlighting code editors that's uh, in the Cloud 9 ADE. So yeah, Mozilla are, are contributing to this area already, and they're, they're kind of potentially one of the key players in it. Um, Excellent. So um, something that we haven't really got into yet is the licensing around um, mm. Scraper Wiki. So what, what license is it under, and why did you choose that license? Yeah, because we should be sure, make sure we talk about both code licensing and data licensing, because they're both quite interesting. Right, yes. So mm -hmm. in terms of code licensing, the Scraper Wiki code base itself is licensed under the Ethereum GPL. And the reason for that is that we want to make sure that if other people use it, that they do contribute back. So the same kind of ideals as the GPL. Um, mm -hmm. And the only way of doing that on the web that's credible, it's like literally using the GPL would be useless. It wouldn't achieve that goal, because you can, you can ship effectively ship web software that's very interactive nowadays. It feels mm. like it's desktop software, but you're basically bypassing the rule because you're not shipping a binary. So I, I would personally like to see the uh, next version of the GPL default to a fairy like clauses because I think the web's so important. Anyone in their early 20s would just like look at a license like the GPL and go, but this makes no sense. No one ships binaries anymore. I don't understand it. Um, so, so, that's, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Then there's the licensing of the code of the scrapers themselves, um, where we have, mm. it, it, for the sake of simplicity, they're licensed with the GPL um, and the, the ones that are public. If you buy a private vault, then you can license them how you like and do what you like with them. Um, mm. Now, this leads on to this interesting question of open data licensing. So this is another area where the open source world has inspired a whole new, as you know, in loads of areas, open source is inspiring people to open up other things. And one of these things is data. And there's an Open Knowledge Foundation, which are a fantastic, unique um, organization started in the UK by a chap called Rufus Pollock that trend, uh, sort of lobby for improved, more open data. And they have a, an excellent thing called an open the Open Data License, which is sort of analogous to uh, Creative Commons or the GPL as being a license used for data that you want to be open. Um, hmm. What we, we, one of the problems we have with Scraper Wiki is lots of the data is sometimes ambiguously licensed because it's owned by a government agency and they haven't defined what license it comes out as. In the US, this isn't a problem because it tends to be default to public domain because there's a law that says basically United States data is, is, is uh, government data is, is in the public domain by default, but we don't have that in the UK. So quite a lot of scrapers will be scraping data where there's not necessarily a kind of completely understood license. Um, so we can't, yeah, the, the situation is complicated, is, is, is the answer. Mm. So at the moment, what Didn't, we do is similar to GitHub. We just let people have to, you have to work out the license yourself. Right, okay. Didn't the, um, I'm probably showing my ignorance here, but didn't, didn't the government come out with some kind of official <laughs> open data license? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. What, what do you think about that then? It's really good, uh, and it's used in lots of places, and yeah, I like it, and I'd like to see it be the default. But the problem is if you ask for a specific piece of data, say you use what do they know to make a freedom of information request for a specific thing, and you get it back again, often you don't really know what the license to that specific thing is, because there isn't a default that says anything released is, is open data. So yeah, I, I'd like to see, that for government data, that being the default. Right. So I'm interested actually to hear you saying you're using a Faro. Uh, my experience yeah. is that uh, most organizations that use a Faro do it because they want to scare commercial customers into buying uh, proprietary licenses as a, on a dual licensing basis. Is that what you're up to as well, or are, are, you, good, are, you, the good, are, are you the good guys? Well, at the moment, mm. our, our revenue models are doing particular scraping, like making um, scrapers that are for a particular purpose that tend to stay private, so that's a different revenue model. And we're also working on this selling the vaults, which will be a more software as a service, where we offer a whole solution. Um, 
I think it's, it's too early yet for me to say what the effect will, the licensing effect will be for other users who have their own installs. Um, but yes, I think it's fair to say we would like to have the option of doing a revenue model like MySQL did of, of selling licenses where people don't want the Faro GPL, they want to do something else with it or want to link proprietary code to it. Yeah. Mm. Right, right. <laughs> And when it comes yeah, to the okay. data, um, uh, uh, is the data also something you believe that you can in some way sell on, or do you think that, that is, uh, the, the, the data is, is permanently just in Scraper Wiki? For, for, the public, for the public data, where someone's scraped a site in public on Scraper Wiki, there's no, we, we, can't really, we don't make any extra claim over the data. It's, it's got the license of whoever originally made, produced it. Um, the for data which someone's gathered and put in private inside a vault, we're gonna a plan would be to help them do things with it that are useful. So the ideal would be if we found places where we can make cost savings. So if multiple people want to do processing with the same data, obviously it makes sense to only do it once. And it'd be great if we could look, you know, find find good ways of, of doing that. Um, right. Mm, it's, right. Yeah. It's so, really and um, I. I so in order to do that business model of mm. uh, uh, scaring people into buying proprietary licenses, uh, are you going to be um, having a contributor agreement from community contributors? That's a great question. Um, I, I, yeah, and I've been reading with interest the arguments about that. So, uh, yes, I'd like to, to have that. We haven't got one in place at the moment, but yes. Uh, we, uh, yeah. Ah, mm. I'd encourage you to go read my blog about? before you make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should send, send me the link I should read. It's um, right. partly, the real question here is about community building around the software, which isn't something we've, we've done yet. It's mainly open source at the moment as a kind of reassurance that the platform isn't something that's going to go away and is a proprietary platform. Um, we haven't, we're not at the stage where it's a, a project where we have loads of contributors from lots of different places. Right, right. Well, if you mm. get a contributor agreement, I can assure you, you won't be in that position either. Mm. So. Mm. It's difficult. One of, one of the difficult things, which is, so like I said earlier, the web is changing open source. And what's not clear yet is if you have a service which is basically a web, fundamentally a web service, uh, it, it might not make economic sense for lots of people to run their own installs unless they're really like, they've got a really good reason to do so. Um, and it's, it's not clear yet how that will pan out in terms of... Um, the, 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 the licensing situation is, is not, it's not the same as it was for MySQL, because in MySQL, they weren't offering a, a hosted database. The default wasn't that you put all your data inside you know, one central MySQL like software as a service repository. And that's just because that's not the way people distribute your software then. But now this software distribution is changing to software as a service. The equation as to what people will contribute to the code and how people edit the code and how people even get you know, access to to motivated to do that. That equation is changing. Um, so I, I would like to see that acknowledged more in the discussions about this than it, than I kind of, and, uh, than it is. Because it's, mm. it's, it's quite interesting. Okay, so I've got a, a, a few more kind of technical-ish questions. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of our listeners like to get very into the technical stuff. I'm afraid Randall's not here to give you the yeah, really low-level right. <laughs> low level stuff. <laughs> but I do have some questions about that. I noticed that uh, at the moment you support Ruby, Python, and PHP. Um, yeah. Are there any plans to support more languages or change, you know, drop any of those languages or any of that kind of stuff? So r right now we're doing other things to make the, make the whole site more useful and... Mm. Um, and develop users, which so we can add a new language and we might get then another twenty percent of users. But it doesn't. It, we, we there are more significant things that we need to improve first. The mm -hmm. next language we pick is actually JavaScript, so Node.js support, as in so service okay. JavaScript. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is because everyone knows it, and because not only does everyone know it, they also know how to do scraping in it because there's a, a standard li Node library that replicates doing jQuery like CSS selectors on HTML. So people already know how to kind of pull out bits of data using JavaScript. And mm. one of the things, one of the, so the advantage of doing it would be if you know .NET or you know Java or you know um, uh, yeah, Haskell, you probably also know a bit of JavaScript. <laughs> it's a platform yeah. the, most new, the most new people. We get lots of people obviously asking for Perl, um, mm. which we've, yeah, we haven't done yet. <laughs> Ideally, okay. it would be just the kind of you could put a hash bang line at the beginning of the file and run anything you like, and we wouldn't specify, you know, we wouldn't care. Mm -hmm. 
Right, okay. So, um, what's the kind of split like between the different languages? Do you have any figures for that? Do you know which is the most popular oh, of the languages that are on there? The, so, we get quite a lot of Python because we've done okay. uh, kind of from quite uh, culturally, we're quite sort of Python y. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, other than that, it's got slightly more, it's a fairly, it's a fairly even mix. Um, I think that it's actually a little bit kind of um, doing scraping writing in PHP is like kind of scratching yourself, and I wouldn't really do it. But lots of people mm -hmm. love doing it and like using PHP for that kind of thing. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and it, it's, uh, well, one thing we often talk about here is uh, PHP is so ubiquitous. It's on, you know, every, mm -hmm. you buy the, a little commodity Everyone web hosting thing. Yeah, PHP is always on there, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, uh, sorry, go on, you, you say something there? Oh, I was just going to say that's one of the reasons we picked JavaScript if we were doing another one, is because if anything's going to be the commodity kind of language that people know in 10 years' time, like PHP is, is now in that context, then it's likely to be JavaScript, just because mm. you kind of have to learn it anyway to write the client-side stuff, so you may as well learn it for the server side at the same time. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, so I, I wanted to ask some some other questions about some of the other stuff that you've done, um, because I, I noticed mm. that you've done uh, you you worked on uh, Tortoise CVS. So you actually created Tortoise CVS, I which is still the, quite fun. the original creator of Tortoise CVS. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so what is that? And then what is it? <laughs> it's um it's a Windows GUI application, but it's open source. Oh. So it's for using <laughs> CVS, which for for the younger listeners well, you can't yeah. remember CVS. Yeah. It's concurrent version of the system. <laughs> And it, yes. was, it was the first kind of non-locking version control system, really, that was in wide use. It, it, it's difficult to believe in the, in the world of Git these days that people used to actually lock, do, lock whole files to do version control, but they, they did. And mm. uh, CVS let you do it concurrently and was the first one to do merging when you kind of, both two people edited the same file remotely. And it was very kind of... Yeah, it's, it's, it was, I don't know, when did you know when CVS was first made? Early 90s, I would guess. It's sort of a layer on top of RCS. Anyway, so I was using it, uh, and we decided to migrate to it at a games company called Cyberlife that I work for in, in Cambridge, mm -hmm. in England. It was back in 2000. And the user interface, WinCVS, I found really clunky. And in a, a chat with uh, a chap called Ben Campbell, we realized that actually... It, half of the problem was that it was recreating Windows Explorer. And actually, I don't really want to recreate Windows Explorer and learn this new thing that's a bit like Explorer but has version control commands as well. I'd rather just have the version control commands inside Explorer. So we work, I worked mm. out that you could do a, shell, a Windows shell extension. And um, more just because I, I find it really funny to mix um, proprietary open source things. So we had not just a Windows application, but a Windows shell extension, which really bears itself into Explorer, the heart of kind of the Windows GUI. Um, but it was open source in the GPL and promoting an open source uh, kind of version control system that's actually been, ultimately, that's been very disruptive. Um, mm. Because one of, one of the reasons, I'd say you know, most corporations nowadays, I'd, I'd love to see figures, but I, I would guess most, certainly most, starting new projects will be using open source version control software, often subversion, which is a kind of descendant of CVS. And one of the reasons mm. that that could work is, is because the GUIs were quite good under Windows for, for those things. So yeah, it, it's... Mm. I think the, the most exciting thing about Tortoise CVS making it is that I, did, I stopped working on it after a couple of years and everyone made loads of other tortoises, which was kind of really <laughs> quite amazing. Um, I remember talking to, some, trying to uh, report some kind of bugs and things I thought weren't right about tortoise version early on and then kind of just being annoyed with me. And it was then I realized, actually, this isn't mine anymore. They've got a vision for it that's kind of different and beyond my vision for it. And then they went on, now tortoise version has something like 30 million downloads. It's an enormous, it's an enormously popular piece of software. Um, and there's mm. like a tortoise git now and so on. So it seems to sort of keep moving forward with the times. Right, okay. So you're, you're not the benevolent dictator of the project then? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, well, sort of CVS is, being ma yeah, is maintained by a couple of people really well and they keep improving it and doing iterations on it. Um, but it's, it's like, um, yeah, they've, it's, it's been transferred to other people working on it, which is what I love about open source, which is you, you can... People can run, pick up the ball and run with it when it's still interesting to them. Uh, mm, yeah. Okay. So, w what actually got you interested in, in free software and, and open source then? Do you remember a first experience where you were exposed to it or something? Maybe a, a defining moment? There was a, the first time I heard of it, there was, it was the first time I met a proper hacker 
which was my first mm. job in 1996. So it's kind of, there were people at university who were, but I didn't think of it in those terms then. Um, and he, yeah, he just did crazy shit. This was back in the days of still using DOS and Windows 3.1. And he wrote things that did like low level network protocol stuff to control a whole room full of machines and all sorts of crazy hacks. Um, and he loved hmm. the whole culture. He read the jargon file and all the MIT hacking stuff. And he was very into that. And it was him who introduced me to the GPL at some point. I remember being a little bit... I've always been interested in things which, um, which disrupt and, and make things kind of... Uh, that make things more efficient, like hacks like that. And I think the GPL as being a really brilliant legal hack. Um, <laughs> I'd like to see more, more legal hacks like that. And it's... Yeah, it was it was it was quite exciting to discover, and then a, a, a bit later on, it, it actually came about just practically as well. So at work, make, making game software, we found we were using more open source naturally. This is in the late '90s, and it's difficult. Mm. Like no one would credit it now, but it used to be the case that there wasn't a standard image reading library that was open source. Like everyone didn't use libpng for bitmap images. It, it, mm. it just sounds ridiculously far-fetched now. Like, obviously, every company in the world now uses, you know, every IT company uses libpng to read in bitmap images. Um, but there was a time when that wasn't the case. And those libraries were just maturing in the late 90s, and it was just inevitable that we would use them. And uh, I think that, yeah, and that led to us going, there was another person again who was an activist going, let's use, let's use open source. Then we wanted to do stuff on the web, and the web was very already linked, quite linked to open source. So, I, yeah, I... As a kind of activist, I've always been quite political. I liked it culturally. And then as a, as a techie, I liked the fact it, it uh, opened up new possibilities and new freedoms and, yeah. Mm, excellent. So, so doing stuff under the GPL, and, and, and you mentioned the uh, Afero GPL, is, is mm. kind of a, um, a, an important moral thing for you then? Important moral thing? No, well, I, I, well, uh, yeah. I don't think all software should be open source. I think some software should be proprietary. Um, but I think mm. it's okay. So the way I'm thinking, of, I'm, I've been thinking about this more in terms of data recently because that's the, the, the field that's changing most. And there's this tr new trend. It's, it's hardly a trend yet because only one company's done it really, which is Nike, amazingly, the, the company that makes trainers. Nike have got an open data initiative. They've actually hired Ward Cunningham, who invented the wiki, to work for them and help them open up internal company data. And yet a few, some years ago, they opened up data about their um, factories to try and get activists to help them monitor them for abuses of the employees at the factories. And these were factories that were in their supply chain rather than ones that they necessarily controlled and owned. So they, they're using open data to try and you know, control their business better, which is kind of, which I find fascinating. And hmm. what, what a company should do logically, you see this, so Facebook have open sourced their data center designs because it's not a competitive advantage to them. And actually Google are behind on this because Google still think that their way they run data centers is a competitive advantage because it was 10 years ago. And they're still acting like that, and yet, and they're going to gradually fall behind because things like Hadoop and things like OpenStack will get better and better and better. And at some point, it'll just seem quaint to all the stuff inside Google. Um, they won't, you know, they won't be able to catch up. And and Facebook are preempting this a bit by going, well, we, we're open sourcing Cassandra, we're open sourcing. So in terms of both software and data. There's no reason for a company not to open source everything except their competitive advantage. So it's the same thing as Google using Android to the, well, I hope Android resumes being open source soon, but let's assume it is open mm. source. The way Google are using Android is like open source as a weapon against, uh, against Apple. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is it, to them it's a commodity. They don't need to make money from selling the mobile operating system, but they do need a good a mobile, you know, they do need a good mobile operating system. So it's not their competitive advantage for uh, an the operating system to be proprietary, so they open it. So what would increasingly happen is it, it, in the selfish interests of companies like Nike, companies like actually Microsoft have got open source code every day, they contribute to the Linux kernel. So it's in the interests of most companies to start to open things up just to reduce their costs. Facebook will hopefully get people doing innovations, efficiency savings on their data center design, and that will save them money because they'll get sold back to them or fed back to them. And as they do it selfishly for efficiency reasons or for disruption reasons, Nike want to open source information about their cotton supply chain because they're worried about um, that cotton supply will decrease with time as because um, there is water shortages and they want to have more recycling and to get more recycling they have to alter the the whole cotton industry um, and they're trying to use open data to do that that disruption to 
to release information about their cotton supply chain so that other people can then expect it. Startups can start up innovating on it. Their competitors can go, oh, we could do this together. Or, yeah, we could change this system together. Oh, I see how that's working for you. I can do this. They can collaborate in just the same way as lots of corporations collaborate around open source software projects. So the... The morally, and it's not just morally, just selfishly, uh, companies should release far more open than they do now, and they're already releasing more openly than they ever have. Um, but there's a limit to that. There'll be a point where there's something that they're protecting in some way, um, and then they won't open that. And, yeah, it, it, it's, as a consumer, I don't particularly want to use things that are left. I'd rather everything is open source, and I can pick open source things where I can. But there's a limit to that, so I've... Alas, I'm running it. I've got a MacBook now. I'm not running Linux as my desktop OS anymore because uh, nobody gave me what's called a whole product solution running Linux. They, there was, uh, alas, no, I couldn't go to a shop in my city and buy a Linux laptop that was supported and maintained. It would always work. And I just got fed up with doing it myself. So there's this, um, there, there's always going to be a limit where someone, people do the natural thing because they're, they're breaking it. So from that point of view, I can't, I'm not going to, I wouldn't morally say everything has to be, um, it, it has to be open. If someone can make the world better doing something closed, then they should, should do that. But as a consumer, bloody hell yes, you should, you should damn well be using open. It's like the government shouldn't be buying proprietary software. Why would they do that? They can, they've got the economic clout to insist everything's open source. They'll still get loads of people bidding for their contracts. So they may as well not lock themselves in. It's just, it's just stupid to lock themselves in. It's very uh, it's short termist to think you get a small cost saving for locking yourself into proprietary software. Um, so, so yeah, they, I, I think, um, yeah, it's, it, is, it, is, it is moral, but it's, um, uh, I'm more Eric S. Raymond than Richard Stallman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, well, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's always a, a meeting point between pragmatism and values. And yeah. uh, I think uh, I've seen that conversation you've just been engaging in there go on uh, for a, a whole <laughs> evening. In, in many pubs, in fact, Francis. So, so I, was I, going I, would like I was going to drag yeah. us back to Scraper Wiki, if I may. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I took a look at Scraper Wiki. I was quite excited by it. I, I, I wondered if you've got any favorite scrapes in oh. there. <laughs> if there are some <laughs> things that, that are really yeah. well worth looking at. So uh, there was actually one today that I've just put on, on the front page, which is called Flickr Camera Makers, where someone's scr been scraping Flickr. It's actually, this is an interesting example, because really he's calling the Flickr API. But he's been, he scraped Flickr and built a, a, an on-running data set of which cameras um, uh, are in use to take different kinds of photographs. And he's made a view on Scraper Wiki. You can also write little CGI scripts on Scraper Wiki that export the data. And he's made a view that shows you, you know, that 38% are Canons and 18% and, you know, are Nikons and so on. So uh, I'm giving that one as an example. So one of the categories of scraper people make is a kind of almost selfish thing, like a very personal thing, like they have a hobby of digital photography. So they um, uh, take a, do a scraper in order to get information about their hobby. Or I scraped some marathon results. I ran the Liverpool Half Marathon. And if you search for marathon on Scraper Wiki, you'll find my scraper that has my results in it, where I could then do, you know, that could then let me do analysis that I couldn't get from the website that, that, that the results were published on. Um, so, I, I, so that's quite interesting. And Twitter scrapers are often in that category. So then there are the ones where there are really good public data projects. And my favorite of those is the, at the moment, is the Australians. Um, so yeah, if you click on click to open this view there, then you'll get that, that, that up. Uh, so this is on, on screen is the Flickr, Flickr camera maker usage. So this is, if you, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, if you yeah, scroll down a little bit, you'll see a pie chart that shows the, um, the, the first camera. He's done a whole page of analysis. It's quite kind of amazing. And if you follow the Powered By link, you can get back to the source. One of the really good things about data, it's like one of the important things about open source is actually when it goes wrong, you can look at the source code to understand how it really works, even if you don't care about any of the other advantages of open source. Yeah, I'd love to have the source code to Windows just so I could, when I was writing Tor to CBS, have actually looked up how some of the APIs really were being implemented. And likewise, with, with journalism and data, it's really important people cite sources. And that's one of the right. sort of purposes of Scraper Wiki is to make that processing kind of visible. So the, the, there's a planning project. If you search for, let's see, let's try searching for planning. I think that might be the best one. 
There's an organization called Open Australia, which are like a My Society type organization in Australia. And they've got a site called planningalerts.org.au, which has Australian planning applications. And if you search for planning on ScrapeWiki, you'll find lots of them around there. Things like uh, Fairfield City development applications and Walsall planning applications and so on. So, I think, no, sorry, that's a UK one, Walsall. Anyway, there's, there's, a, and there's a whole bunch of separate US states, and, uh, separate Australian states and Australian cities, which Open Australia have scraped, writing a different scraper for each one. And they pulled it together into one national data set of planning applications which they've then created a website of, which lets you sign up so you can be emailed when um, uh, one of ScrapeWiki's founders, he had a pub down his road, which was about to be, he didn't know until he came home and it was knocked down. It was a lovely old pub in Brixton. And he was really annoyed because he was just outside the range where they send postal letters to tell people about the planning application. And he, he built Scrapers uh, and ScraperWiki ultimately, just so in order so that in future he wouldn't miss any of these uh, these planning applications. Right. And you could track planning applications in different places. So the Planning Alerts Australia people, they're a, a really fascinating project doing that. Um, yeah, I can go on all day with projects like this. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm actually was going to stuff. also ask you if there was any particular scraper that had had a big effect on public policy or on a particular situation, whether there was a, a place where you win the um, Mosquito the Big Carnarvon Award for the biggest effect from the smallest activity. Oh, um, I, haven't, I haven't seen one that's, that's politically had that effect yet, actually. That's a, that's a really good question. I will start to watch for it. Um, there, are, there are good examples of that in the, in the My Society sites. They tend to be more... So say they work for you, change the copyright of Parliament, and uh, what do they know is altering a bit how FOI law works in, so, in terms of copyright. So sometimes by doing things in the way that you think the world should be rather than the way it is, you can, you can create disruption. Right. And right. that's, that's, that's diff slightly different from the kind of thing ScrapeWiki tends to get used for. So I don't, I don't, have, yeah, I don't have an example like that. I've got right. um, an interesting one, another interesting one in terms of, of, of boldness of scope. There's a, a startup called Open Corporates, which is an open data startup. Expect to see lots of open data startups as people understand what it means. And their model is to gather loads of information about companies across the whole world. They want a database of every company in every jurisdiction in the world. And to do that, they're scraping, first of all, just the identifiers from the kind of company registries everywhere. And they've got dozens of scrapers on ScraperWiki. They're using it as a platform to gather those scrapers together. And what's good about it is they get local knowledge. So they can get someone in America to scrape some American ones, someone in Brazil to scrape in Portuguese and so on. Um, and they're finding it really valuable for that. And the interesting thing about them is actually the business model, which is, uh, is you're asking about sort of contributor clauses for open source. The yep. interesting thing now is contributor clauses for open data. Um, and he, their model is to release all the data under an open data license, but if someone wants to link that data to proprietary data, then they have to then pay for a license, which is, mm. sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, that sounds uh, very uh, familiar, yes. So, mm. so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm also interested to hear, you know, many of the things you've said there uh, about uh, motivations. You know, you seem to be uh, somebody who believes in the pragmatism of motivation. Uh, and it seems to me that, uh, uh, you know, you keep on talking about people being selfish. Well, I, I call that <laughs> self-motivation. Self you know, I think it's about taking people's self-motivation. I describe open source as the synchronization of a whole set of self-interests mm. to make some greater mm. activity happen. Mm. Yeah, there's this weak and annoying sense in which people sometimes go, oh, but nobody's actually moral or ethical because everyone's ultimately, ultimately motiv motivated by selfish motives, which is tr you know, true, but kind of annoying. Um, the reason I, do, I talk about like that is because I think that's what creates the really powerful things. So the, the, the reason that, um, I don't know, lots of people release their code on GitHub isn't because they want to share and contribute to the world. That's kind of, it is that, but it's also just because it's more convenient to release it on GitHub. Uh, just, it's just like, where should I put it? Oh, that's a place I can put it easily. And then they get lots of sharing as a kind of side effect from that. And yeah, you can do things where you expect people to just be honourable and nice and release stuff because uh, they're good. And we should do that, and we do do that as a society, but it's always going to be smaller than things where people create a public good through, through something which they're much more motivated to do directly. Um, 
Yeah, hmm. and that's the me uh, itching, scratching itches thing of open source is exactly playing on that. You scratch your own itches, and then the whole community's itches get you know become an amazing product. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm uh, I'm afraid we're, we're running low on time now because we, we could talk about this all day. But uh, yeah, I want to like, quickly enormous. ask you a few more, couple of things to kind of wrap it up for everyone. Um, so, uh, where 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 where's the kind of future of, of Scraper Wiki? What have you got planned coming up uh, in the roadmap and wow. so on? So we won the. Um the Knight Foundation, which are a news innovation, uh, fund a news innovation competition in the US, which we won in the summer. So we've got about an 18-month project to do data journalism across the United States. So if anyone listening is a geek or a hacker or a data journalist, then do get in touch with Scraper Wiki and tell us you're interested, because uh, we run these events where we get together hacks and hackers into one room and get them to work together on data to make stories and to make applications. And that's going to be really exciting. And then part of that is building on a platform. So we, we want to make Scrape Wiki more useful. We want to make it more, more powerful. Uh, we want to do things that, that make it a better data hub. And we're doing what in the startup world is called you know, the kind of pivoting, changing angles, trying different things to get the optimum mix for that. So that's, those, are the, those are the two main kind of activities we're doing at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're, from a business point of view, we're also working with uh, business business media publishers, so kind of trade magazines and things. So if anyone knows about those, I'd be interested in, in connections to them as well. So things like farming magazines and healthcare magazines, that kind of thing. Okay, cool. And if people want to get involved, the best place for them to go is, uh, is, Scraper Wiki, is the Scraper Wiki website, I presume, yeah, um, to you go can, and find out more. You can just go and start writing scrapers or editing or forking them on the Scraper Wiki website. You can mm -hmm. um, also look at the Scraper Wiki source code, which is on Bitbucket because uh, we're kind of python -y people that we're using Mercurial and, and Bitbucket, <laughs> um, which seems very, very old-fashioned now. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, quite, 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 quite funny. Well, it's a fast-moving uh, world in the, in, yeah, yeah, the yeah. development just, world, yeah. Yeah, Bitbucket have just launched Git support, so we're wondering whether to move to that to kind of be a compromise. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, have a, have a look at the Scraper Wiki source code. And there's a Google group. If you search for Google Groups and Scraper Wiki, there's a public developers group. It'd be lovely if you've got questions about scraping and to ask them on there. If you've got projects you want to do that involve scraping in interesting ways, then, then go for that as well. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'd love, love to see, see yeah, lots of in engagement from people about that. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. And we have um, two questions that Randall always asks every guest, and I suspect <laughs> I know the answer to the first one. Um, Perl or Python is the first question. <laughs> I actually learned Perl first. Um, I'm going to pick Perl just to get you wrong. Wow, okay, okay. cool. The reason I'm going to pick Perl will be is pleased. I love, I don't actually use Perl anymore because you, you to some extent you have to use what other people are using and that's like an important, I, I'm a polyglot. But um, I love Larry's essay, essay about Perl as a postmodern programming language. I just think it's brilliant. So that's, that's mm. what I like. Okay, excellent. Well, Randall will be very pleased with that answer. Um, and, <laughs> and finally, the, the last question that he always asks everyone is Emacs or VI, which is your favorite? Uh, VI? You mean VIM? Or VI. Yeah, it's, or VIM. It's, yeah. it's, it's VIM, yeah. I've never, I remember loading them both in, and this is when I first installed Linux. I was like, okay, should I learn VI or Emacs? Which should I learn? Which should I learn? And it was the white inverse video bar at the bottom of the Emacs window. I just didn't like it. <laughs> Wow, okay. <laughs> that's, that's as good an answer as any, I suppose. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so thank you very much, Francis, for, uh, for coming on. I'm sure I'll see you around Liverpool. Um, uh, if yeah, I stick my yeah, head out the window, I could probably wave right now, but um, I won't do that. Um, great, so thank you, you for coming on and telling us about uh, Scraper Wiki. And um, thank you for having me. No problem. So, Simon, uh, what did you think of all, of all that? Uh, very interesting stuff, I thought. I, absolutely. I, I, you know, I'm a a very big fan of Scrape Wiki and more particularly of all the things that my society has done. Uh, that uh, hacktivism that's going on through software hacks on government data and on freedom of information really is changing society. Uh, it's, you know, it, it was the My Society group that did the Prime Minister's uh, petition website that turned into mm. a formal mechanism to petition Parliament. Uh, it's the activity that's gone on through there that's changed copyright law around uh, legislation. Uh, and further than that, they're also actively getting involved with the mechanisms of the cabinet office and government and changing the way people think about data, changing the way people think about interacting with uh, the, the, the population. So I think it's really fascinating work. I think he's done some great work. And I think Scraper Wiki in particular is very interesting. I'm going to be playing with it. It's got a very low, mm. uh, barrier, very low barrier to entry. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that's very true. I was interested that he said uh, one of their key um, goals was to make it possible to kind of write code in your browser, which I think is, as you say, a, a great way of getting people involved because a lot of people don't know what tools they need to write code or run it or anything like that. And if they can just open a text box in a browser and start typing, that's very cool. Um, okay, then. So I'm going to quickly wrap things up because we've uh, we've rambled on for quite a long time, but I should tell you about what's coming up uh, in future on the show. Um, we've got uh, next week, Aaron's going to be back with uh, the guest project is uh, Superfeeder. And uh, I'm going to attempt to pronounce, pronounce the guest names. It's Julien uh, Genesto, I'm going to say. I'm assuming it's a French name. Um, and that's on the 12th of October, which is uh, next week. And then the week after that, we've got Junus Leitman from um, Vadin. Uh, these names are really difficult for me to say, but we'll just hope that I'm getting them right. Um, and uh, that's on October the 19th. And then the following week, we've got Massimo Di Piero, who's going to come in and talk about web to pi And uh, that's going to be on October the 26th. And there's much more coming up. And if you want to find out what's coming up on Floss Weekly, you can do. You can go to uh, twit.tv slash floss, and uh, you'll see a link on there to the upcoming guest spreadsheet. And you can open that up and see who we've got coming up and what's happening and uh, plan ahead, all that kind of stuff. It's very cool. Um, so I'm going to very quickly tell you about uh, what I've got coming up. Um, I'm going to be, after I finish this, in fact, I'm going to be going down to Liverpool Lug, Liverpool Linux user group, where I might even see Francis because he lives in Liverpool. And uh, I'll catch up with those guys. But if you if you are in the UK and particularly around the Northwest and you want to come to Liverpool Lug, um, you're always welcome. It's the uh, first Wednesday of every month. And if you go to livelug.org.uk, you can find out more about that. Um, then next week, we've got Bar Camp Blackpool coming up on October the 15th. And uh, yeah, it's a technology conference in a casino. What could possibly go wrong there? Um, so that, that's going to be interesting. And then we've got a, another bar camp coming up, Bar Camp Liverpool, on the 18th and 19th of November. Uh, if you want to find out anything about the kind of stuff that I've been up to, um, such as Python conferences recently and so on, uh, you can go to danlynch.org to find out more there and also find links to my Twitter and Identica and so on. Uh, so I think that just about does it. So Simon, where can we find out more about what you're up to? Um, you can find out more than anyone could possibly bear to know about me on webmink.com or by following me on Google Plus or by following me on Twitter. Uh, if you want to meet me in person, I'm going to be at the Libra Office Conference in Paris next week. That's going to be a great nice. conference. I hear there's uh, over 250 people coming to that. There's a party every night, uh, lots of <laughs> good food and good cocktails. And uh, we'll be hearing from the LibreOffice community about their progress in uh, their new governance and in doing new releases. don't know if you saw today, there was a, uh, a new release that came out with a security fix, which is a, a definite must-go upgrade to anyone who's running OpenOffice.org or LibreOffice. It's worth checking out. Mm -hmm. uh, then I'll be, I'll be in San Francisco for the OSI board meeting. And I'll be talking there uh, with people about the governance changes at OSI. And I will be in Spain in November as well for a Forge Rock meeting. So if you're in Spain and you'd like to run into me, uh, drop me a line through the contact form on my website. Excellent, excellent. And it, it's interesting that you mentioned LibreOffice because uh, we, we just talked about it recently, uh, last night, in fact, on Linux Outlaws, that it's just the first anniversary, first birthday has just passed for LibreOffice and still going strong, and it's good to see it. Absolutely. Uh, well, LibreOffice is uh, it's a year old now. It's got a diverse community. I remember people saying when the uh, LibreOffice fork happened that it wasn't going to go mm. anywhere, that all the developers worked for Sun or now for Oracle and that there just wouldn't be anyone sharp to work on it. And so uh, the, the results are really impressive. They've changed um, something like 5 million lines of code in there. Uh, they've, there's, mm. there's something like 250 to 300 developers working on the code. There are paid developers from Novell, from uh, Canonical, from Red Hat, from uh, Tata Consulting Services, and from more organizations working in there. The code has been deployed by governments uh, in Europe and in South America, and uh, that's all just one year's progress. It's, uh, it's quite very, very impressive. Well worth going and supporting those guys at uh, LibreOffice.org, I think. Definitely, definitely. And uh, thank you very much for, for joining me, Simon, and asking such great questions. I knew you'd have some thoughts on open data in the UK and so on. So uh, it's great to have you aboard. My pleasure. It's good to see you again, Dan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that'll do it for this week, I think. So uh, Aaron will be back next week to, uh, to join you for another Floss Weekly, and we'll see you then. Take care.